I have been talking about making a Viking apron dress for years and it's time to finally get this project started. My vision for this project is to recreate a 10th century Viking Age Norse woman's dress, sort of commonly referred to as an apron dress or more accurately a smock. <laughs> With a sheep's fleece that I will clean, scour, spin, and weave to create the cloth that I will then use to sew my apron dress. But that's not all gonna happen today right now in this video, but we will get this fleece scoured. I want this project to be as historically accurate as possible. And we'll talk about what that means in just a moment because I thought too hard about the angle of historical accuracy and got myself stuck in sort of this tangled up knot of perfectionism. So while I'm telling you about getting past my perfectionism and considering the uh, implications, I guess, or uh, achievability of historical accuracy, while we talk about those things first, I'm going to be sorting through this amazing Icelandic sheep fleece from a sheep named Cole. So I'll give you some views. I'm just sorting through it, looking for any vegetable matter or things that I don't want to have included in my project. And later on in this video, I will show you how I will be scouring this fleece. For me, as a skilled hand spinner, part of the appeal of this project comes from the fact that we have extant examples of cloth preserved in various ways from the early medieval period. Some of these preserved scraps contain enough detail to know what diameter the threads are, what colors they might have been, the amount of twist put into each thread as it was spun or plied, and how it was woven. We can see how many threads were packed into the space of a centimeter across the warp and the weft of the cloth, and what, if any, designs were woven into the fabric itself, the weave structures. I plan to make this project as historically accurate as I possibly can, down to the breed of sheep that I will use for this wool. Like this wool that I'll tell you more about in just a minute. For the past few years that I have been dreaming of completing this project, I have been doing lots and lots and lots of research. I've read books academic papers, watched YouTube videos, and spent time in the historical costuming community. Among historical costumers, there is a scenario that happens over and over again. It's almost like a rite of passage <laughs> for people when they start costuming, and I've witnessed this play out in real life several times, and it goes like this. Someone will make a costume, wear it to an event, or post pictures of it on Instagram or wherever, and then have all their joy sucked out of them when somebody comments, That's not historically accurate. And next, people will run to defend the person with the apparently less than 100% historically accurate costume. The defenders will throw Uno reverse gotcha retorts back at the joy-sucking commenter like, Nothing can ever be 100% historically accurate. Did you leave all your cloth from local sheep's wool and flax you grew in your backyard? Were you starving during January because last season's crops failed? Are you suffering from consumption while you hand stitch every seam? <laughs> historical accuracy. On that level, it's a myth. And there's always one more impossible to achieve layer of accuracy that we can dig it down to. So on the one hand, we want people to discover and enjoy new hobbies and everyone has a learning curve, particularly when that hobby involves practical skills or expensive materials. So we don't want to gatekeep and shame people away for not being good enough. And it's true, there's no possible way to achieve 100% historical accuracy. And I do think we should maintain a perspective on the drawbacks of modern reproductions. However, 
for something that is impossible to entirely achieve, we sure do spend a lot of time judging historical accuracy, particularly in movies and TV series, pattern designs, and something I've noticed <laughs> when showing off a project that a lot of research and skill went into making. Currently, some of the best keyword phrases to get high search traffic results for content about Viking clothing includes accurate Viking clothing, authentic Viking clothing, and the search term with the biggest numbers is historically accurate Viking clothing. Clearly, it's something that people want to know about. As I plan to make a historically accurate dress, I feel a need to talk about how something that is impossible to achieve can also be a benchmark to strive for. And I wrestled with this a little bit. <laughs> a lot. I wrestled with this a lot. Mostly because of how my brain is kind of spicy. Uh, <laughs> but on a broader level, I really want to reframe this whole concept of historical accuracy for the purposes of projects for YouTube. I think it might be helpful. So let's imagine we have two dresses. They are exactly the same cut, shape, and color. They're both dyed from locally foraged dye stuff, but there are some differences. The first dress is made from 100% wool that was purchased from a local fabric store, but that dress is 100% hand sewn and finished. The second dress is hand spun and hand woven, but it's machine sewn and finished. So which dress is more historically accurate? Hmm. What do you think? If we are striving to get as close to 100% accuracy as possible, what moves us closer to success? Is it the amount of time and labor, the effort that went into it? Because in that case, the second hand spun dress will probably win. Is it the overall look? Because hand finished seams might win in that case. Or is it the depth of research done on the context of the dress within the time period it was worn? That work might not be visible in the finished garment at all. Is it the use of local, naturally dyed color? Because if so, then both dresses are equally historically accurate. So clearly, the goals for the costume will determine where the focus on accuracy and research will land. And that means that the efforts that are valuable to one project may not apply to another. And that frustrates me <laughs> because as I started planning this project, it just twisted me up in a mental pretzel. And like I said at the beginning, I want my project to be as historically accurate as possible down to the threads of the cloth. But with so many components of a project like this, I have to be selective in which parts I am going to focus on because it takes so much time. <laughs> I just don't have all the time. And that's really hard for me. I got to a point where I started to realize that I was procrastinating on starting this project by indulging in endless research. <laughs> Like, get on with it already. So while I was getting ready to record this video, something hit me and I, I found it really helpful. I was thinking of historical accuracy as if it was a linear sliding scale moving us closer to or further from the goal of being correct and accurate. I was thinking of it as something that we can get closer to by stacking up accurate techniques and materials, but toss in something that was blatantly modern and it would counter or undo any progress made to get closer to that historical accuracy benchmark. So I thought, what if historical accuracy is not a linear scale with an impossible finish line? What if it's a spectrum? When I started looking at each component of my project, 
as <laughs> existing, like alongside each other, grouped together, but still existing as individual elements. Rather than seeing each component of the project as some sort of collective cumulative progress to the finish line. Somehow, just that small shift in my mindset was enough for me to get past my perfectionist tendencies to let the parts of this project where I'm very skilled, such as the spinning portion, stand on its own and not worry about my lack of hand sewing skills canceling out the perceived historical accuracy of this project. I'm kind of already planning to machine stitch all the seams that can't be seen and just hand stitch the visible stuff for the finishing because I'd rather spend my time doing the spinning. We all know spinning is where my heart is. I was also really hung up on some of my equipment. I have a counterbalance loom, which is a later technology than what was used during the Viking Age. Norse women would have used warp weighted looms. We have clear evidence of that, but I don't have a warp weighted loom and I don't know how to use one. I would love to learn someday, maybe for a future project, but for now, I need to move forward with the equipment I do have. Using a counterbalance loom, because it's what I have, doesn't devalue my project or the work I'm putting into it. It just means that I'm using different equipment for one aspect of the project but we will still be able to engage with this project as existing with hand-woven cloth. And that is still really valuable. I guess the fear that someone would see my project and say, oh, you didn't use a warp-weighted loom, that's not historically accurate. And then finding myself tumbling down the endless spiral of nothing is historically accurate. History is a construct. Let's all give up and buy a dress from Xi'an. <laughs> It's a spiral. It felt inevitable. But maybe that voice that I was afraid of wasn't coming from someone else. Maybe it was coming from me. I, I mean, seriously, it really poured fuel on my imposter syndrome, which of course I have. We all have that. I want to spin this entire project on replica spindles based off of archaeological finds, but the truth is I don't have the time. That's incredibly time intensive. So giving myself the freedom to spin a portion of this project with historical tools. But then, once I figure that out, I'm probably going to bust out the rest of the project with my spinning wheel. And that doesn't feel like cheating anymore. It, it no longer feels like it would invalidate the spinning part of my project. It feels like I'm using my time, tools, and resources intentionally, which I'm, cer I'm, I'm certain people have always had to consider that. I mean, that in and of itself is probably a historically accurate thing. And I know that I have the ability to duplicate yarn, to come to that level of confidence in my own skills. It's actually taken me a really long time, but we're getting there. <laughs> Before I have even started this project, I've learned a lot about myself and how I approach these kinds of complex project goals. And I've also learned that I still have to wrestle with my own relationship in regards to perfectionism, procrastination, and imposter syndrome. And those are all real things that are worthy of some reflection, but I don't want to stew in it either. Sometimes you just have to get started, <laughs> plunge right in and get going. So far, you've been watching me play with this incredible wool. <laughs> and I'm sure you want to know about it. Let's talk about why I chose this wool and where it sits on the spectrum of historical accuracy. <sighs> yeah, so let's take a hike on a different trail for the rest of this video and talk about this wool. I mean, I know that's what you really came here for anyway. In this book, The Valkyrie's Loom, one of the most important resources that I'll be referring to throughout this project, Smith talks about the kind of wool that was used in Scandinavian textiles and what characteristics it had that were valuable to the production of cloth. She says, 
The variety of sheep's wool used in textile production constitutes an important aspect of all North Atlantic woolen items. The northern short tail is characterized by its dual coat. To reiterate, in Iceland, the outer coat is called the tog and the fibers are coarse and possess internal medullas, while the inner softer coat is called the thel and has the appearance of soft merino wool with the absence of medullas. During the Viking Age and much of the medieval period, these two fibers were combed and separated and used for different purposes. This feature is unique to the Norse textile tradition. <laughs> so for this project, I wanted to find a dual-coated breed belonging to the northern short-tail family, and this fit the bill. The sheep that grew this fleece is named coal, which is an old Norse word meaning coal, like, like the stuff you can dig up and burn, um, and it also means dark, and that makes sense given the natural color of this wool. Cole is an Icelandic sheep from a farm that is practically directly across Lake Michigan from me. So technically, I could sail across the sea <laughs> to get my fleece for this project. He's already here with me, though. So this is a picture of Cole. It's from last fall, and his shepherdess said that he has a lot of personality. He loves to run and jump around like a lamb. Uh, Cole was a twin. He was really tiny when he was born, only two pounds. And look at him now. I'm so glad that he had good care as a teeny tiny little twin. And now he's an amazing Icelandic sheep. And I'm so excited to use his fiber in this project. There are many breeds that belong to the Northern European short-tailed family of sheep, and you can take a look at this list that I've put together here. I tried to include not only their English names, but also the names that they are referred to in the language of wherever these sheep came from. They are called short-tailed because their tails typically have 13 ver vertebrae compared with over 20 vertebrae for other sheep. They are found mainly in the British Isles, Scandinavia, Iceland, Greenland, and the areas around the Baltic. They are thought to have developed from the original sheep brought to those areas during the Neolithic and were further spread around to various islands and other locations by Norse Vikings. I don't think it can be overstated how essential and foundational wool was to the whole Scandinavian economy. So these are Viking sheep. Trust me, if given a chance, these sheep will take off and raid your neighbor's alfalfa, and they have no scruples about it. These little northern sheep are very hardy, adapting well to harsh climates, and are currently being studied for their potential role to play in sustainable grassland-based production systems and land conservation. They are able to graze and utilize pastures anywhere from lowlands to steep mountain slopes, making them less dependent on the use of fossil fuels in the forms of artificial fertilizers and grain feeding. They also possess a great range of genetic diversity, which is now being recognized as an important resource. Valuable as they are, though, many of these short-tailed breeds are currently endangered. As demand for larger sheep with more uniform wool production brought other breeds into these northern regions throughout the Middle Ages and later, the short-tailed varieties were crossbred or displaced until only small pockets of them existed in very remote areas. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that the surviving short-tailed breeds became recognized as worthy of preservation. The best way to preserve the populations of these valuable historic breeds is to learn their history and use their wool. <laughs> Hand spinners keeping wool relevant since 6000 BCE. <laughs> so let's focus on coal here because dual coated sheep produce less lanolin. They are much easier to clean. I'm doing a light soak with coal and then I'm going to scour with some unicorn power scour. I would like to have a little bit of lanolin left in the wool, so I'm not using much scour at all. 
I find that having some grease in there helps to lubricate the fibers and it makes separating the tog and thal much smoother. So I tried to figure out, did people historically scour their fleece or did they spin in the grease? That's what it's called when we leave the lanolin in there and just get right into the spinning. And I couldn't find any evidence one way or the other to indicate if wool was typically scoured or not before, I mean, maybe or after combing and spinning in Norse textile production. So if we look at other places in France and Spain, there is lots of documentation. Uh, it's, it's later in, the, in time, uh, 1700s, I think. And it shows that wool was scoured in large heated cauldrons, which would have been a necessity to pr process the really, really, really greasy fine wools that they were using, such as merino. But I had trouble finding anything specific that would be relevant to the much less greasy dual coated fleeces. I did find some information that in Scotland, spinners would rinse the mud out of a fleece. Sometimes the whole herd of sheep would be run through a stream to give them a good rinse before shearing. And then they would typically dye their wool before spinning it. So, so that process of dyeing the wool included the use of stale urine to produce urea, which is part of the dye process. And that would also have the effect of scouring any lanolin out of the fleece. Oil might be re-added later to assist in combing. And there is evidence of combers sitting near fires and also heating up their combs. There are some medieval images of a comber with his, his combs on some coals to heat it up. And the reason you would heat that up is so it would melt the grease as the wool is being combed and that grease would lubricate the wool. So whether there was grease from the start or grease added in later, I do know that having grease in there assists with the combing process. So there are other places such as in Holland where there is a tradition of spinning in the grease to the point that some of the equipment that's traditionally used there works better with greasy fleece. So we've got, we've got fully scoured, uh, scouring is a byproduct of dye, not scoured at all. So I had to make a decision on hand, how to handle my fleece. And so I've decided to lightly scour it using Unicorn Power Scour. Um, and that's because I'm not interested in scouring with stale urine, no matter how historically accurate that might be. I have to draw a line somewhere and I know you appreciate that. <laughs> While I've been talking, I was pulling out some of the darker colored wool. You can see how different that section of the fleece is to that section of the fleece. And this still has the tog and the fell. It's not like, um, you know, it's not different in that regard. It's just the color. So I'm going to have this separate as a sort of a darker color, maybe if I need an accent later on. But the rest of this is... It's more brown and gray with the tog and fell. So maybe I'll use this for some trim or something where I want it to have sort of an accent. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I'm gonna start just with this section and then I'll work my way through the rest of the fleece. I'm not scouring it so much that it will dry out. I really just want to get the dirtiest stuff out of there. So it's more of a plenicent experience to work with. But honestly, as I've been handling it and feeling, um, feeling this wool, just as we've been talking here, this fleece is really incredible. There's hardly, hardly any vegetable matter in there at all. I am really excited to work with this. It feels really nice. <laughs> If you look at the water that was left in the tub after the last rinse, there's some sand in there that sank to the bottom, but the water itself is fairly clear. Clear enough. Anything that's still in there will get taken out when I wash the yarn before it gets woven.
So now this is all laid out so it can dry and it's time to go rinse and repeat <laughs> again and again and again. <laughs> So the next part of this project will be to separate the inner and outer coats of this fleece and prep them for spinning. This project will span several videos, but there's so much to talk about with a large project like this. And I do hope we can learn from this project and find valuable techniques and information that will serve us today. Because that's ultimately the point of studying history, right? It helps us build a shared sense of identity and connection to our fellow humans. And it teaches us things that we can use in relevant ways now. Let me know your thoughts on this concept of historical accuracy. And if you want to join my Patreon, we will have some book chats coming up. Uh, that's for anyone at any level, any tier. There's different bonuses, but anyone is going to be able to access the book chats. They will be through Zoom. And the Valkyrie's Loom is our book choice for March. So I hope to see you there. Happy spinning, fiber friends. I have some wool to go scour. That process of dyeing the wool included the use of... of Stale urine <laughs> to pre for their potential role to play in sustainable. <laughs> Is that a green wool nap? Seriously, how did that? How did that get in the? I this was part of a project from months ago. These things are like glitter. You can have that. Don't let it out of your sight. It's like a triple right to trash. Right to jail. <laughs> it's like a triple. If you let the wool naps loose, there will be too many of them to deal with. Yeah. <laughs>